Welcome to another fantastic interview here on Kung Fu Conversations. We are honored and a little bit humbled by having Sifu Douglas Wong on today. Sifu Wong, thank you for making the time to talk to us today about life and Kung Fu and everything in between. Sounds good. I'm glad to be you guys having me here on your show. So I have something funny to tell you. Apparently, you have a beef with my old stomping ground that you you also momentarily grew up in. I grew up right outside, 15 miles away from Grand Lake, Colorado. Yes. And what, do you remember what years you and your family had the little restaurant up there, Sifu Wong? Well, it was, let's see, we were here, I was born in 48, we moved out in, uh, I believe, 50, 1952, 53, around that time period. So you were so young. Yep. I was the only, uh, was I went to uh, kindergarten and first grade there in, in Denver, Colorado, so around mm. that time period. Do you remember the name of the Chinese restaurant that your folks had in Grand Lake? Oh, I don't remember. I don't recall it at all. Sorry. That's okay. That uh, you you would have been three or four years old. So yeah, I was I, young. So you know, I I don't remember the names. Have you ever been up to Grand Lake since then? No, I haven't. I haven't gone back up there. I've been to Denver a couple times because of the uh, AAU meetings. So that okay. I was uh, vice chairman of the Chinese martial art thing. So I went for the meetings over there in Denver. Well, we're going to have to have you up on a road trip and for uh, either a cup of tea or a cheeseburger up in Grand Lake someday. I can't, I can't even imagine how much it's changed in almost 70 years. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> I go to Colorado once in a while. My daughter lives there. She lives mm. in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Yeah. Sure. It's just yeah. down the street from us. Yeah, so yeah, she's you know, my two grandsons there. So you know, my wife goes every month to visit. So I go every so often. Nice. Well, when you're in Excellent. town, we'll have to meet for a cup of tea or something. Sure, sounds great. Sounds good. So I was listening to a great interview that your son did with you, and something really surprised me about your martial arts origin story. Would you give us a brief synopsis? of what your training was like a little bit. And then I have questions off of your origin story because your story was very unique. And I have some, some things that I'd like to point out and ask you about your, your martial arts training story. Okay. Could you give us a little background, Sifu? I'll try. Okay. I, but some of my memory is gone because I had a stroke. So there's some mm. stuff that is not there anymore. I got pictures and videos of me at the events talking. Sure. I, all the damn thing about it. Mm, so sure. I'll try to do what I can do. That's all Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. Some things is just like yesterday, so I, it, it's it's there. So certain things are not there. Uh, I started out to in uh, uh, taking judo. That's the first martial arts that I took. That was Gardena. That's the only thing that was being offered. Kung Fu was not even offered in Los Angeles during that time period. So mm. that was not until way later. So in between that time period, I went into uh, judo first. I went into Shotokan, Goju style, uh, Tang uh, uh Aikido. Uh, any art that was open, you know, I, I wanted to learn. So that's why I started. Then and, um, my teacher opened up the first Kung Fu school in 1959, Los Angeles, Chinatown, as Grandmaster Art Yui Wong. So I joined him not until the uh, early 60s later on. But by that time, I already have probably about uh, seven, eight years of martial art training prior to getting into Kung Fu. Now, I tried to get into Kung Fu earlier, but uh, through the Wong Association, because my dad was not in a certain part of the village, they would not take me. So mm. I couldn't learn from the Wong Association. So there's many associations down in Los Angeles, the Lu's, the Chins, the, you know, everything else you can name it, that they had it. But so uh, I later on learned from some of my friends from the Lu Association, learned the Choli Foot System. Mm. They were under Master Mao Ban from uh, San Francisco. So I, I picked up a little bit of Choli Foot from there. And uh, during that time period, you know, uh, I, I was taking the Kung Fu from Art Wong, but we were also going to what's called LA City College at that time period. 
And during that time period, I met uh, my training partners, you know, that I've known for over 50 years. That was Carl Totten, uh, Tommy Chan, and Wilson Kwan. So all four of us have been together since their 60s. And uh, we trained together. So at, during uh, open classes during LA City College, we got together and, and, and practiced all the time. And then we met many other people there from Hapkido, from uh, Tang Sudo, from Choi Lee Foot, uh, Eagle Claw. Uh, praying mantis, uh, Shotokan, you, uh, you know, you name everything. We were all practicing to see what the hell worked. So mm. during that time period, you know, we, I found some of our, our Kung Fu flowery hand stuff didn't match up to some of the hard style punching, like from Shotokan. You know, they threw that punch in there. You, if you didn't stop it, if you try to block with these soft uh, blocks sometimes, it didn't work. So, you know, it, it was a training period for all of us. And we practiced seven days a week. We were crazy for that. And we were going around to visit various schools during that time period. But L.A. was a melting pot. And you had a lot of the top teachers here. Uh, you had uh, Fumi Demura was, uh, was out there. Uh, Oshima, Nishiyama, uh, Ed Parker, uh, uh, the Rango, the Lee brothers. I mean, I was going everywhere, anytime, just to, just to meet them, uh, to practice. Uh, the BKF was another one that was one of my favorites. I always worked out with those. I was Steve, Steve Sander turned Steve Muhammad later on and Donnie Williams. And they were the top fighters at that time. So we always got together. They were top fighters. I was top form uh, competitive weapons and hand forms. So we always got together. So I've known those guys for <laughs> forever. And right now we're working on a documentary on the BKF uh, history. It's called uh, Our Fists mm -hmm. of Black. So I'm working on that. Uh, documentary right now it's been going on for the last four years so uh i have a podcast with them uh well uh zoom meeting with them next week so uh, we've been doing it for every over every other week try to go back into history talk about the tournament how how it all started who we met during that time period uh politics going on during that time period mm. Japanese to Korean to Chinese you name Okinawa Filipino everything this is a melting pot it was the greatest time in LA to study everywhere and and I got to meet a lot of different masters you know from different systems and and, and just to learn some of the different movements they had uh mm -hmm. some of the Chinese foot where they uh, one, one one guy was you know, took the bucket of water and used his chi and moved it around, popped his hand, walked, made the water jump out the bucket. I mean, we were seeing that, bringing flies back to life, uh, breaking bricks every other number, you know, seeing it all. It was fun. It was learning. And and another style was Mao San, which is one of the, the black arts, you know, and they would put a mouthful of uh, incense, a whole handful into their mouth, and, and nothing would happen to them. They'd put it all over the body, you know. And my teacher told me not to learn that style because you have to be a certain way of doing that, and it's going to take away from your health. So I avoided it. I saw it. I got to see some of the different craziness that they did. But uh, like I say, we, we learned a lot of different things. I got exposed to many different systems and uh, just loved it all. So That's amazing. That's fantastic. Okay, any questions from you guys? <laughs> Owen? Um, why don't you start off, Randall? Okay, I know this is going back in time, Sifu. But if you can, what do you remember training like Ar with Ark Wai Wong? What was that like? What would a class be like? What would segments of his teaching style and methodology be like? Because my goodness, that gentleman had so much material to pull from. I mean, he had the five animals and the five families method. How That's amazing that he could contain all of that in one person. What was training with Grandmaster like? There's a couple of ways. Okay. One in the regular classroom was kind of bad, okay? Because I came from a structured system of, you know, karate has a different way. You come there, you bow, you do your techniques, you know, you're breathing, whatever it is, and then you have your warm-ups, you have your practice, you free sparring, or whatever it is. In his class, when I first went up there, I was sort of disappointed because what happened was not – Everybody was practicing at the same time. There was no set program. Everybody, there's chairs all around the whole studio. 
So you see these guys sitting and talking, having a soda, taking it easy. Other guys are back there pounding with the ditta jiao and the hand, practice the iron palm. Uh, you know, but there was no formal class. You know, it, it, it was really difficult in the beginning when I, I saw that. Was since I came from a structure, I said, "Whoa, how are you gonna, how are you going to learn anything like this?" You know, in a structured way. But so I was taking private lessons also, so that's a whole different animal altogether, because it was just one on one. So sure. So everything was taught. You know, whatever he did, you had to follow. That was the whole thing. If you caught it, great. He would teach you more. If he didn't catch it, he water it down. I seen him do private lessons for people where you do maybe eight or nine circular movements and the guy can't catch it. He only catch three. So he watered it down to those three movements and he forgot about the other five movements altogether. And so mm. that's how the way he taught. So if you picked it up, you got stuff. You learned. So me, yes, I, I, I picked it up because I was already intrigued by other style and learning, watching watching what the upper half of the body would do with the lower half, because the legs got to work with the upper half of the body. You got to have the stance. If you don't have the power from the stance, you can't do anything with the hands on the, on top. So, you know, so I, you know, I learned that from the other system besides the Chinese system. So that was what was good for me. I, I learned to observe. So I, I saw that. So later on, when myself and Carl Tanwin took other private lessons to learn the more advanced form, he will watch the feet. I will watch the upper part of the body, and we combine mm. it together. <laughs> and so we, we got it down pretty well. So so that's how it went. So so we, you know we weren't stupid. You know we didn't try to catch the whole thing. Say yeah, you do this part, and I'll do this part. I got it. And when he came back, he said, "Damn, you guys got it." I said, "Yes, we do." <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. That's awesome. And other times when I was taking privates from him, he was teaching me how to like break the bricks. But he would take those center to build, you know, the building the walls. He would crack those suckers and break them like there were nothing. Ooh. And you know, he would stand on top of me for the balance, for the crane doing this movement. But he would just just iron palm and break that suckers like it was nothing. It was like dust. And he had me do it. I about broke my hand. Oh man, I'm <laughs> I'm there crying in pain. <laughs> but, uh, he could do so many different things. And other times. Um, I, we had a private group class. Uh, about half of it, we started as a group class because uh, my teacher, when I was taken, was Kachi Kempo instructor. He got killed in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So all of us, there was like 12 of us that was taking lessons uh, during high school time period. And then uh, we decided to go look for a new teacher. And that's when we went to Art and Yui Wong. So during our private classes, it was different. So uh, was he paid attention to our students. You know, we all wanted to learn. But after a lot of those guys dropped out, then I had to go into the regular classes. And that's where those guys were just sitting around and drinking so they're not really a, a, a structured class-wise. So, but when, when I was working with him there, uh, the privates, I mean, he would show me different movements of, of breaking things, how he used to pound his fingers. Uh, we had different buckets there, one full of sand and pebbles, uh, BBs, different things like that. And, and uh, you know, and then he did a technique on one of my classmates. I hit, touched him and dropped him on the, on the ground. And then I was laughing. He said, you don't believe what? I said, no, sir. So we come up here. You know, I'm, I'm one of those guys. You got to show me. That's it. <laughs> He, so he took his finger, he's only like five, six, he had to reach up and come down uh, <laughs> to my head, and he popped me in my third eye, and I hit the ground, it was like taking a hammer and hitting a, a, a block of wood, I mean, that's how loud it was sounding inside my head, and I dropped the ground, and then he said, come here, boy, rub nothing on your head before you die, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you know, it, it was something else, it was his dim monk, so... And I always related that to my students, you know, and so they always knew about it. So we went to Vegas uh, a few years later to do a demonstration, and my student kept bug bugging Grandmaster Wong. So what, he keep telling them that you touch them and knock them out. I said, like, yeah, yeah, but we don't have medicine here, boy. So mm. <laughs> we can't, we can't do it. Right. Said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to hit you a little bit off the point, not on the exact point. And he did that. That boy was in hurting all day long, all day long. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and after that, they believed. They said, yeah, I said, I'll tell you guys, you know, 
you know, anything he says or do, I believe after that point, you know, was, you know, he proved to me that he knows what the hell he's doing. And mm-hmm. guys used to come in and challenge him all the time. You know, he said, what you going to do, old man? And these are karate guys coming in. And so he t- he'll go up there and he'll do his famous crane kick and kick him right in the blind and make him pee on themselves right then and there. Oh, man, that old oh, man was crazy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's uh, awesome. He, he was great. And, and we used to travel a lot. We used to go to uh, uh, San Francisco and, and uh, uh, Marysville. That's where the first Chinese temple was built. And huh. so we, it was called Bomb today. And that's where the Su Sing Tong and the Hak Sing Tong were fighting against each other on Sunday when they shoot these little coins up in the air. So whoever grabs it, there's certain ones that are worth more money. And mm-hmm. man, talking about some kicking, some fighting. Yeah, there, there was some some gang go- stuff going on, and we were part of Hopsing Tong. So I was always demonstrating Hopsing Tong for my teacher, uh, Grandmaster Art Wong, and Grandmaster Shir K. Lu, who's also a part of it. They were part of these, you know, lion dancing parties. Mm-hmm. So it was a good old day. So you know, we 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 used to demonstrate for him there, and he'd take us to the to the Tongs there in, in Maryville and introduce us and do different things like that. It was, it was a lot of fun, you know. And then the Hapsan Tong in Los Angeles with the many demonstrations there also and, and line dancing and different things like that. But uh, you know, he always used to take us out for lunch and different things and <laughs> stuff like that. And when I first opened up my studio in 1973. Uh, he came over and visit many times to see the classes because we were under the five animal system during that time period. So he was always a jolly guy. I mean, he was something else. And we worked on a uh, 1971 worked on a Kung Fu uh, pilot film. So uh, mm-hmm. that was, that was uh, another great time that I got to work with him and uh, a couple of my other senior classmates, uh, uh, Master John Leone and uh, Master Ralph Shun. So we were all part of his uh, watching studio. Great times. Wow. I was just going to ask, what you know, out of all the, the styles you learned uh, from him, what, what was your favorite? Uh, I, uh, the, the five animals are good, because that's why I teach basically still over 50 years since we opened up our studio. But there was a system called Mokta, which is mm. a style, which very few people know about or do the way that was taught, you know. And uh, my teacher, Tiny Lafiti, uh, was the one to learn from Tiny, I mean, from uh, Art Wong. He was uh, also learned from Ralph Shun, who was uh, Art Wong's number one boy. They had a school in uh, Huntington Park when they first opened up. And then Ralph left to open up another studio, and, and Tiny kept that school in Huntington Park. So that's where I went to practice. And uh, learn the fighting system that he had. It was, at first, he was part of the Lima Lama organization. It was Tino Tulusega was his cousin. So there was. Oh, wow. Of, yeah, there were cousins. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so they developed the Lima Lama system. So the uh, Tiny helped do it. So he's part of the uh, first class of the Lima Lama system. Everybody considered, kept calling it uh, co founders. They were not co founder Tino was the founder. And he, like he says, the rest of the guys are just my students. They're not co-founders. <laughs> they were learning what I was teaching them. So that's why he was teaching a lot of stuff, the old style. Because he also learned from Art Wong. Mm-hmm. So he used to have the guys come to the garage and he had them sit in the square horse and he threw flour all around their feet so they couldn't move. If they moved, you would see it kick up. Huh. <laughs> so he'd come back an hour later to check on it. <laughs> so, it was so a lot of the stuff, uh, the Lima Lama is influenced by Art Wong's uh, style, you know, mm. of horse training and things like that. So that's why a lot of the Lima Lama movements have the, the Chinese movements in there. So mm. that's pretty good. So also Tina would also learn from Art Ed Parker, who went over there started as mm. a white belt up in the black belt level. So he also learned the Kempel system. So he has a certificate which was signed by Ed Parker and Art Yu Wong. So oh, uh, wow. Wow. It's, it's I've only seen once and we haven't seen it since. Been trying to get a copy of it you know, since he passed away, but uh his wife won't release it. So hmm. did you get to work with some of the splashing hands that Tiny did? That, that see that's that's what we call Mokka. Splashing okay. hands is Jim McNeil. Jim McNeil okay. Okay. learned from 
tiny, but at a different period, you know, after. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he called a splashing hand. And then that's what everybody called it after that, you know, because he put out a video, uh, a videotape on it and so forth and, and this kind of stuff. But what we learned from Tiny was completely what he learned. I mean, his movement was not as clean as what we learned, you know, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different. I mean, I know the guy, Jim, for over 50 odd years, you know, so we have our ups and downs. <laughs> and so, so it, it's there, but, you know, what we did, what I did with my system is completely different from what he did. So he, he has a different approach because uh, he, he learned from Shi she, she, Hong Shi, who was one of my teachers, my healing teacher. But he also went, and after he passed away, he went to learn from Shi Hong Shi's teacher. So they were teaching the different methods of the Shi Ni style and the healing era. Did, is there, do you know? Because I, I I don't know this, so I wanted to ask you, Sifu. Is there somebody that's passing on Ark Wai Wong's full system? His grandson, Si uh, Ming, took over of the air of the system, so he's mm -hmm. now teaching all over Mexico and South America, uh, Peru, everywhere down there. So he's uh, teaching supposedly to all, all the art, you know. So. I was there before he came over to the United States, you know. Mm. So mm -hmm. he came over later. So Grandmaster Mong used to have me drive him home uh, on Sundays, you know, after classes and stuff like that. So I've known him long before that. And uh, during that time period, I was trying to teach him some of the remote uh, system up there privately behind the curtain. So, you know, I, I used to get him back there and try to show him. But I don't think he retained any of that stuff, you know. Mm. Um, uh, he, he, he's, you know, he, he knows the forms, uh, so he's teaching it all. You know, sometimes he, he he doesn't like the way I teach. You know, but I, I'm I'm a whole different breed altogether. I, I was not just the five animal five family, so that's the right. Thing. So if you see some of my demos that we do, it was a whole completely different art. Those guys, are, that's not five. That's a, I didn't say it was. You know, afterwards, there's, there's elements in there, but mine is a white lotus system. I said, my whole system is completely different. I said, none of you guys can match me when we do demos, so don't, don't even talk about it, you know. I, I'm a whole different breed altogether. So mm -hmm. I did my, most of my style, you know, because I, I learned different style. But, you know, I when we did our demonstration, it was Hollywood style, Hollywood fool, as they call me, you know, <laughs> because we did it. We show, you know, we put movements in there that nobody else had or 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 you, we didn't go through through the complete forms you know because you know you do the starch the lunis, the lunis, stuff like that when we did the demo i just took portions of the form the main part after they finished they go halfway through then the next four from the start after that, the next weapon start. it was a continuation it was like you're watching the kung fu movies it's everything's mm -hmm. going up high 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 and finally we stop we're finished that's it and you still want more so that's why I did all my stuff. Because, you know, I'm an entertainment business. It's a whole different thing altogether. That's why our guys are always so sharp, you know, doing pop demonstration from the 70s up to 2000, you know. So we're always wanted by everybody to do shows and stuff like that. So that's where we were. But, you know, we do have structure in our forms. I have 10 different levels. You have to go through, learn all the different forms, learn about the... The basics, the external, the internal, uh, the meditation, uh, qigong, everything. So it was all part of the art. Wow. You started in a time period when it seems like functionality. Like you, you've talked so much about it, and I, I love hearing you talk about it. Because I think these days, especially in what people are calling traditional Chinese arts, it seems that the usage or the practicality in a self-defense method has been lost somewhere in the process. Um, was that the gold standard back then, Sifu, in the 60s and, you know, the, the whatever time period it was, if it worked, you trained it, and if it didn't, uh, maybe I might keep it for posterity, but... You know, I just, it seems like you, like you said, you had a melting pot. You had, you were doing some karate, you were doing some tang do, you were doing hapkido, you were doing uh, judo, you know, your origin point. You know, I just, it, it's, it's fascinating because 
these days I just run into so many people that are moving their arms that have, have no idea what they're doing. Could you talk a little bit about that, Sifu? Yes. Was when I first got into it, self-defense was very important, especially, I, I guess, when I was in the Kaji Kempo system. If it didn't work, why use it? <laughs> was there was guys, I mean, they were throwing kicks, punches, everything was for real. So you have to make sure that the technique worked. So that's why I, I based a lot of my fighting later on because of that, you know, precision. And especially after I started with Heine, his whole thing was street fighting. It wasn't tournament fighting. He cared less about tournament fighting. It was hmm. street fighting. So he used to have us fight against each other. He was So we, when we were fighting, he said, no backing up, no backing up. He had a baseball bat behind each one of us. When we backed up, we got whacked. After that, man, I didn't go backwards ever. I ran the sucker over. That was it. There's no way that he could stop me. So the <laughs> technique was going forward, ending it quickly as possible. My school was always known as fighting. You know, when we were I, we were doing full contact way back then. I mean, I, I, I was probably in the first one that we started here in California in 1970. Mm. That's before all the kickboxing and everything else was going on. And so it was a tournament in La Fuente, and it was uh, put on by uh, Kempo and Lee Malama. And so when we got up there with the black belt level, you know, I was fighting. I was doing the whole thing all day long, taking the kids, putting the headgear on and, uh, and stuff like that. So we were allowed to wear shoes. So we were fighting during that time period. So when it got to black belt level, Chuck Norris's people, Mike Stones, all those guys, they all dropped out. Only ones left fighting in there were the Kung Fu people. And that was it. And, and so that's the way we did it. So if you look back at my history, you see that my system, I, I had a lot of the heavyweight Kung Fu fighters, middleweight Kung Fu fighters. They were, they were winning. They fought, one of them fought Benny Yukitas. So that's all documented. That's all film. That's all. So, you know, what the other Kung Fu schools do that out there? You know, not the Dragon Wilson was doing that, but that was later. Mm -hmm. I was out there in 1973 with the BKF guys. So we were fighting all these uh, when we started full contact fighting. And that's where it was all started. Then Nikita's and, and uh, all the BKF guys and a couple of guys with Hawaii, so forth, Mike Stone's people. So it, it, it was um, uh, a lot of action going on during that time period. But I always based my on street fighting. My, my method of fighting was I'll put you up one Put you up against a wall where you cannot move. So you have to defend yourself. So I have one guy throwing just punches. So he used to work against two objects. Then I tell him, okay, now you got to add the feet. Now you got to fight against four objects. Then I put a second guy in there. Then I put a third guy in there. I put a fourth guy. You're fighting four guys at one time, and you got to try to block everything that's coming at you. And that's the, way, that's the way I thought. And then later on, uh, instead of the hands and the feet, I start using sticks as a smaller object. So it's, you have to really refine your block in during that time period. So that's why I did. So that's why I train my people. Um, Highway Patrol, LAPD, uh, Secret Service, FBI, you name it. They were learning. That's where I follow. So there, there, you know, FBI guys in San Francisco use all my techniques. They follow my videos and stuff like that. And they say, yeah, we could get a lot of guys. And that's what works real well. I said, thank you. That's all I wanted, you know. Mm. So, so I was no nonsense. I didn't play that. The you know, survey thing is one way. You know, your point fighting and your that kind of stuff. It's not real fighting. My thing was 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 for real on the streets. If you need law enforcement, if you need to take somebody down. Let's go. Let's do it. So that's what mm -hmm. it was. So yeah, our, our our fighting was serious, very serious. And I had a question for you about the uh, the the tournaments from back then, like, um, were they mostly like points based or was it, uh, like, what was the structure just kind of generally? Then it was point, you know, uh, uh, in the Japanese one, you had people fighting. So it was mm. a whole different mm -hmm. structure. And when you went to the regular open tournament, like the international, so forth like that, then it was a uh, uh, point fighting again. Mm -hmm. So later on when, the, when, uh, uh, the kickboxing era start coming in, the, the blood and gut era, uh, you know, so so all of that stuff start coming in. So the, the fighting start changing. So sure, 
in the Chinese later on, because during that time period, there was no Kung Fu tournament. So in a way, they said that I've sort of forced the Kung Fu people to start having their own tournament. Hmm. Because, you know, they, they, they didn't understand our fighting. A lot of times, like when we went out, our, our first tournament that we went out in 19, May 1973, we went to the Tadashi Yomashiro's karate tournament. I took 30 guys over there. We did Kung Fu forms, weapons, everything else like that. He didn't understand what the hell we were doing. The judges gave us zero. Oh, wow. Jesus. We were going crazy uh, over the movements that we're doing, the jumps, the flips, the whatever we we're doing. So we won the crowd, but the judges didn't understand what the hell we were doing. Right. So mm. we, 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 <laughs> that first tournament, zero. Absolutely nothing. Second tournament we went was a Lima Lama tournament that was hosted by Tina Tulu Sega. Since he learned from Art Wong, he took those judges and he said, you have to, when you judge, you got to judge on their focus, their movements, their concentration, you know, all this kind of stuff like this. You just try to get these karate guys just you know, up to par. You can't judge them on karate movement. That was the whole thing. So after that, after that tournament, Man, we clean house. We won over 500 trophies in six months. We killed every tournament that was out there. So it, it didn't matter. And we were fighting. We were fighting with shoes on. We were the first school allowed to wear shoes in tournament. You mm-hmm. know, we're from the lightweight kung fu shoes. You know, mm-hmm. you know, I had our group was so strong, and I had so much power during that time period with all of those karate tournaments. Yeah, you can bring your boys. You want to fight and shoot? That's fine with us. And that's what's happened. So that's that's what we did. So we did fighting, weapons, form, everything that you can think of. And then in 1974, a lot of those guys said, we can't let you uh, uh, compete in our tournaments anymore. We will pay you to do demonstration. Because everybody else would not enter the division because we kept one at first, second, third, and white belt of the black belt. <laughs> so we just take a truck there and just take all our trophies from them. <laughs> that's that's great. We're entertained. So, so so that's what we did, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, unless we went to out of state or someplace else, we was in the California local area, they wouldn't let us compete in the tournament city. So, so we said, it's okay. We'll just do entertainment. Then we got discovered at the Mayo Farkas tournament where he had all the different Hollywood people come in, uh, mm. producers and stuff like that. And uh, we got picked up for a lot of different movie things. So that's what happened there. So we just stuck with the entertainment business. That's why my son now at a school, we have all these different stunt classes that we open up with actors and, and stuff people. So right there, they need open up a second studio in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So that's where a lot of the filming is done now, all the paint sure. in mm-hmm. Georgia, California. So my son had it. So every time he has all those classes, he has it like four or five times a, a, a year, and they're packed. You know, they're they filming within a week, you know. So it's, those guys are trying to get into the motion picture. A lot of these guys, you know, you have a lot of these different groups throughout the United States, but they didn't have no qualification. They've done maybe some local stuff and so that sounds like every national thing you think of in the Marvel world, in uh, uh, Fast and Furious world, you know, everything else. You know, so he's done all that, Minion, uh, uh, <laughs> he's done all the different music videos, and, uh, uh, all the big names. So, so there's a lot of that stuff. So that's why our, our school, you know, we still teach the Kung Fu part, but a lot of it's into the entertainment business now. Are you okay with that, Sifu? I mean, is it is it one of the signs of the modern times? Because, I mean, you know, the entertainment side of things is going to be very different than the Wushu side of things. But do you see that the traditional side still needs to be a center and and focal point, even if you do Wushu, even if you do the Hollywood stuff, you really need to have a good, I feel like you kind of need to have a really strong foundation and actually understanding what you're actually doing, you know? No, we still have all the traditional Kung Fu classes, Tai Chi classes, so it's there. A lot of guys take those classes and they take the extra classes. Mm. Uh, all the parkour, the free running classes. Uh, the different stunt fighting classes that we have. We have all, all those classes. So, you know, a lot of people try to get into the movie business. They, all they're trying to do is just martial art. Martial art is limited. How many movies out there, you know, are you know, martial arts or not? If you're going to do all the flips, all the jumps, the parkour, the free running, 
that's what you need to add to your arsenal, into your knowledge base. So that's why we have that. So before, you know, all we do, all we do was just come through and Tai Chi. So that's all we did. We just had the classes in the evening, maybe a few classes on the weekend. But, you know, how long can you sustain that? I mean, we did it for a long time, so it was no problem. And when we out of the parkour, the free running, gymnastics, and all that, break dancing, you name it, we have it there every class. And then we're open seven days a week from mm. nine in the morning to almost midnight. So we're going to open the classes. People will come in in the afternoon through, through 12 to 4, and then we had them uh, from uh, uh, 8 to midnight. And I mean, we were packed. Wow. Seven days a week. I was. That's the way it did it, because you had to have something else. And then when the pandemic came, I killed yeah. a lot of stuff. You know, so, mm-hmm. so we, we lost a lot of business there, but we were still functional because we gave special classes in the stencil that kept us going on you know, all the time. So we didn't limit different things. But uh, now, you know, we just full blast. You know, we just, school is ne- never a problem. All these rabbits, that's just going from around the world. We got everywhere. And we got all the different actors and all the different uh, stunt people, you know, you name them. We always got all the top people there. So uh, all the guys they practice in our studio, you know, they come from Japan, from Europe, from everywhere. That's amazing. That's amazing. I know you've got a lot of stuff going on in Mexico too. Could you tell us a little bit about some of your students down in South America? Well, uh, well, yeah, in, in Mexico per se. Uh, uh, let's say we, we've been teaching down there since oh, probably about the late 80s. Uh, my student, uh, Takuchi, well, he was one of my top students from the, the one we'll called the Garage Boys. This is what I like, uh, eight of them. And so when he opened up, he went to San Diego, opened up down there, and he's going back and forth between one and teaching uh, my system with the white girls. And uh, he was also uh, down there with uh, my other teacher, uh, Sherpay Lucas. He was here in Los Angeles, and he moved down to the San Diego area. And, and since Todd was down there, so he started taking lessons with him also. And so we were teaching over the border. So, you know, uh, Todd was working with a Japanese corporation, so he's going back and forth into Mexico. So he learned fluent Spanish. Uh, he was, <laughs> Great. If you name it, he can do it. So he used to do the interpretation for the Japanese company from Japan and, and do it in Mexico. So that's how they did a lot of different things. So then in the meantime, he was teaching all the Kung Fu art that we were doing. Since then, I went. I started going down there about 12 years ago. And um, um, I started teaching the, the white motor system. I was teaching the, uh, mainly the fighting art, the, the, the forms, and so forth. And then uh, I went down to uh, Guadalajara. They took me down there. And so uh, I was watching one of the guys. A couple of these guys were injured. They couldn't do it. I said, uh, what's wrong? He said, I hurt my wrist practicing. I said, well, what, what, what happened? He said, so they told me this. So I said, well, come over here. So I, 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 I restrained it out. So I worked the tendons, worked the bone, realigned it, everything else. These guys said, oh, man, that feels good. Next thing I know, I got 50 guys in the line waiting for me to <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when I started doing the healing aspect besides just the, the physical uh, forms and fighting and so forth. And so now I have so many uh, guys down there are chiropractors, doctors, nurses, uh, you know, just health aid people all learning my system. So I, I teach you uh, uh, my, my system of uh, uh, bone alignment, tendons alignment, uh, so forth, the herbal medicines. And so, and then a lot of my students are acupuncturists also, so they added all that in there. So I got doctors all over the place with my, <laughs> uh, their, uh, their uh, business card, White, White Lotus, you know, healing. So it, it's all down there. So it, it, it's been great that they carry on for me down there. Those guys, are, a lot of students in there are so devoted to learning the art and, and just seeing the knowledge. And now they're helping people. That's the main thing. So one of my uh, uh, students out there now, she's, become, she's backed up by the government of Mexico now. So she oh, wow. Go classes, yeah. She certifies them and so forth. So they want to have me come down there and, and do it. I said, since the pandemic, I haven't gone down there. It's a couple of my 
of health issues right now. So I said, maybe in 2024, I'll go back down there and start going. And they said, good, because we have a lot of people lined up that want to learn. So I said, okay, we'll see how it goes. You know, that so right now, yeah, it must have seemed spread out down there. So, so it's working well, the healing working well. Uh, I mean, they're doing everything. That's great. That's great. Owen? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. So you've talked a, about Ark Wai Wong, which is amazing. You've talked about um, Tiny a little bit. Could you tell us the background and what it was like training a little bit with Shar K. Lu? Shar K. Lu was uh, a system with Thong on Pai. It's an internal system uh, that he learned in the temple when he was young. So when he first brought it over, the United States, uh, the first thing that he taught that was non Chinese was John Leone. So he was in the Kachi Kimpo system. So he was teaching out of his school in that time period. And my partner, Carl Cotton, was a student of John Leone. So, so that's how all that hook there comes in. Okay. Uh, and Leone also studied under Art Wong, so he was part of the Wong Student Association. And Sher Lu and Art Wong used to do lion dancing together for the Hop Sing Tong. So uh, uh, Art Wong would be the head and Sher Lu would be the tail. Okay. You know, that tail, the tail man is most important because he's the strongest. He's the one who will push you onto your shoulder. He's going to hold on to you when you hang over a, a bridge or anything like that. So uh, so they work together very well. And Sher K. Lu was sergeant of arms of the Hop Sing Tong. So, uh, yeah. He, he is one, one guy with his energy, talk about the chi, oh, his energy is very, very strong. So he used to teach us a different ways. So, well, first he taught John Leone. And then uh, after that, Sherry Lou said he wanted to teach more people. So that's when he got, you know, power got involved, and they got me involved. And so that's how we started learning uh, the system. So there are different exercises that we had to do every morning before we did anything, you know. So, so we had to learn all this kind of stuff. And we had to follow a special diet and so forth. And then we start learning his I want high system. So like this style uh, we'll be learning, oh, it's like 10 moves a month. That's all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took forever. You want to make sure every movement is precise. And you know, uh, the, the angle of the foot, the bend of the knee, the right breathing method and so forth. So it took forever to learn this type of system. Uh, you know, our wall, you know, we probably learned the form, you know, in less than a month, the you know, whole thing is completed. Hmm. So, for sure, it may take you six months or a year to learn just one form. Hmm. So it's crazy. It, it's difficult. Now, <laughs> okay. Uh, was teaching at John Leone School that was in North Hollywood, so that was Tati Kemper School. So uh, after John passed away, John Leone passed away after a year, uh, he went to um, jo uh, Kai D. Kai D is one of the actors that played Wu Fat and Hawaii Five O, the ball headed guy and so forth. Yes, yeah, so well, he was also into the internal art. So he had a school at Dallas Sanctuary in North Hollywood. So Sifu Lu was sort of teaching out of there. So he went over there and got classes uh, three or four times a week in that time period. And then he had classes on the weekend. And during that classes on the weekend, I would be there to help him. So uh, he didn't really want to teach him the stretching and all that kind of stuff. So I, I took over and, and did all my stuff over there. All the very stretching, and all the different exercises, arm exercises. You know, push up, sit up, whatever we had to do. So, you know, I got him in condition. Then we went into the form so that he would take over from there. I, I used to help teach for him. And then he, he used to have me interpret for him. You know, my limited Chinese, but I could understand it. Couldn't speak it, but I could understand it. So he used to have uh, do similar and would have me go with him. So we went all the way from here to San Diego, San Francisco, wherever it was, and I would help him. Uh, I do his teaching. He would do it on the internal, talk about the medicine, uh, uh, the healing, uh, what, um, what works for this, you know, uh, Chinese soups and different things like this. So, so I was with him for quite a few years learning that different methods. So, his 
it's I was very precise what he wanted to do. And you know, if there had been time of meditation, he would levitate off the damn ground and then go back down. And she was so strong, he he did healing on different people with cancer, heal her. He did that. Uh, one time, my daughter was aware of the demonstration, and she was feeling sick. She said, Dad, I don't feel good. I don't feel good. It's like hurting so bad. And I happened to be sitting next to see from me. And I said, oh, come on, come on. He just waved his hand a couple back to me, you know, and she was fine the rest of the time, you know. It's just, it, she is just so strong. Hmm. And, um, yeah, he, he, he was something else, you know. There was a couple times I got in trouble in Chinatown fighting. <laughs> he come up there and said, you stop, boy. I was cheating. I said, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't move from there. I, I didn't want to mess with that because he was so strong with himself. I and mean, you feel his energy when he put it out. You know, uh, mm. so good. Art Wong. Art Wong is a whole different feeling. He's more, I, I would say, uh, physical with it. The other month, that's what he had. But sure, Lou, you didn't have to, you know, leave five, ten feet away. You didn't feel his cheat. But it was that strong. So and, uh, and he lived to almost 84 years old. He was hard to One kid, uh, he was 65 or 70 when he had a first daughter. That was crazy. Second daughter, he had an older one from 47 years old, but that's the younger one. So, in that time period, so his chi was still going more than good. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Owen? Uh, I was going to ask you in that system, like, what was your what was your favorite weapon? Did you yes. have a weapon in there? Uh, that, that was just... um, uh, the staff, uh, hmm. uh, the sawhorse, uh, uh, the sword, uh, I don't know what other weapons, uh, a few other things like that. You know, uh, they, they were all good, but like I said, his step is so slow. It's... Right. Uh, I was, I learned it all, I, but I was more into movements. Um, mm -hmm. It's got to be high beat. My, my, my technique, if, if you see some of my demonstration, you see what the movement's like. It's whole completely different thing. So, uh, what, I, what I learned mainly for Sifu was the internal, Sifu move was the internal, the healing, uh, the different things you know, with the curves, I think you think about that. And uh, my other teacher was uh, Grandmaster Do Wei of the World Tiger System. His system was also uh, internal. Uh, mm. He and his father were famous people in China, so he also learned the white eyebrow system up the eye. So mm. he, he was supposed to become the heir of that system, but he decided not to take it. He said, No, just take it for his son. But he said, I have my own system already to the eye. I mean, uh, so that's what he had. So his system was uh, uh, internal. Where, where he, he, he could uh, he could do the palm print, you know, pop the wall, and, and, and you're on the other side of the door, red palm will show up on, on, on your chest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do the uh, coconut break, put a between two pillows, just touch the top of the pillow, and then crack the coconut. Wow. Then he used to say, okay, we have dead flies. And he made it back to life. Uh, he made it fly. I mean, huh. His chi was different. <laughs> so hmm. um, they were incredible. And a lot of guys, what happened was my son was going to learn a lot of these things. It's a certain exercise that you have to learn before you start having sex. So we got to be like, you know, like they said, before 12 years old, we learn these techniques. So I had two students that got to learn from me, but they didn't follow through. One of them was Jimmy Brown, was one of my protege from Simone Confusky here. And the other one was my stuck cabbage. They all love cabbage. But Jimmy was raised in the large yard. And his chi was already strong. And I started getting young. At two or three years old, he was eating headaches and stuff like that, which just moving his hands around people's head and chi and stuff like this. So Chirbu and No Way wanted to teach Travis all the ways of internal of, of doing the chi and doing the levitation and everything else like that. But they couldn't follow the plan. I mean, you know, you have to have a special diet, you got to get up a certain time, you got to do these type of things. Mm. 
if for those young kids, you know, you're not in the temple in China, you have nothing else to do here. That's that's the thing. You know, so they they wish they could have followed through years later, but it didn't happen, you know. So mm. they got a chance. You know, got to learn what what the change is all about. Is there so the white lotus system that you have is comprised of many different methods yes. from many different teachers? Yes. Sifu, do you think that there's something that uniquely is yours that you give to your students through the white lotus system? Is it less the forms and the kata and more how? the student understands the material? Is it your teaching methodology that may be the unique thing that you give to your students, Sifu you Wong? No, all, all of us, it's in there, okay? When I teach my system uh, right now, I don't, but my wife is. Uh, we teach uh, five family style. Uh, 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 and then we teach what's called Yakong Mu. Yeah. Um, that's another system I learned. Grandmaster Richard Wong. And so in China, they're known as one of the best lion dancing groups in the world. So mm-hmm. they, they're very strong. So in the United States, uh, he has one of the strongest groups in San Francisco. So he used to be down here in Los Angeles, and now everything's up in San Francisco. We had a falling out, so that's why we don't. <laughs> uh, one of those things was we. we there's some problems that we have between the students because he was hiding different techniques and different students. You teach mm-hmm. this student this technique, you teach me something, and another student is that, don't show these to the other guy, don't show them this. You know, all these other guys, we were already friends before we even knew you. So that's what happened. <laughs> he talked and said, oh, man, that's a bunch of BS. Why, why is he doing this? You know? So a lot of us sort of dropped out. But, uh, you know, I, I still teach uh, part of the system in my as part of my white water system, so we were being pushed out of all there. So, uh, well, we, we got the traditional kung fu, it's there. You got to learn the form, you got to learn the stances, you got to learn the breathing, you got to learn everything, all the different uh, hand forms in, into the weapon, into the fighting aspect, and so forth. So, everything is still there. And so, like I said, I have 10 levels, I have it all written out. You got to go from level one up to 10, you know, into it. So, it's all there. So, it's still there. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. That is awesome. What do you think, Sifu, about the debates these days? It seems like in the Kung Fu community, there's a lot of talk between traditional martial arts and modern martial arts. Do you have any any takes on that? Or are are we are we maybe looking at it through the wrong lens? Maybe the modern martial arts is for entertainment and wushu and their dig- traditional arts is holding on to not only the tradition, but maybe the fighting concepts. Are are we, are we trying to pigeonhole things or is there, are we allowed to have maybe a variety of opinion on things? What do you think, Sifu? We have a variety of opinion because I'm also into the wushu arts. <laughs> uh, my student, Kenny Perez, I sponsored to go to China to learn all that. So he's one of the top wushu people in the United States. So that is also part of my system. So it's in there also. So Kenny and my wife used to uh, compete all the time in the different uh, wushu tournaments, you know, uh, the, uh, weapon fighting and so forth and handset. So it, it's in my system. So I have nothing bad to say about the wushu. It's, it's, uh, they have the structure ways. They have so many movements that you have to have. You have to have only one aerial. You only have one butterfly, you know, and so forth. So I learned this one that was first brought over to the United States uh, with uh, Roger Tung and uh, Anthony Chan uh, back in the uh, 80s. And so I learned all the different forms for judging purposes. You know, not that I wanted to learn it. I mean, you know, do it. I had my wife. But she was on the first U.S. movie shoot team. And she mm. was also on that one. So uh, they're all part of that. Uh, my main thing I kept with my traditional five family, five animals, and all this other stuff. So I have that. But Wushu is part of our art also. So, so I see it. So you know, Kenny uh, has a studio in Phoenix, and he's all over the world doing it. 
Um, then they move into the Jet League. Uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, see his face. I can't think of his name now. Uh, the guy's that the Wing Chun. One, two, three, four. Donnie Yen. Oh, Donnie Yen. Yeah. yeah. Well, Donnie, Donnie used to come with Kenny Perez during the summer to my house and spend time there and practice and stuff like that. So, yeah, I've known these guys from way back. I uh, know Jackie Chan from part uh, of our family. Uh, he and my brother became best friend. My brother was his best man at his wedding. So, we know Jackie from way back when. So, uh, with him, Samuel Hall, uh, you know, everybody that needs to be known, we know him. Uh, Don Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, Chuck Norris, uh, uh, Ed Parker, uh, uh, you name it, I'm known. You know, so so been around for a long time. So he said, I'm an old, old guy, old guys, old guard. So I've been around since the 60s. So I know a lot of you guys before they got into the movie. Chuck Norris, sure. you, before, you know, I was in Thanks to Go under his system. Yeah. But, you know, he wasn't into acting yet, he wasn't into that. Even some calls. I mean, it's a demonst- demonstration with him before he got into the movie. But Joe Kosuki, I know him long before we got into the movie. You know, so all these guys were way back. Mike Stone, same thing. He was for his four season turn before he got into the movie. Stuff like that. So I, I know these guys for forever. You know, so there's, there's not too many that I don't know. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a, That's amazing. So I'm the Wing Chun dweeb uh, yep. over here. Um, and I, it was funny because your son brought it up. You brought out a book in a time when information on Wing Chun was so rare. Um, what was your experience? Who And I, I know, you know, and you mentioned to your son too, it's like I enjoyed Wing Chun, but it wasn't my everything, which I understand that. What what did you train in Wing Chun, and who did you do that with, and what was it like, and have you kept some of the drills and some of the things in Wing Chun in, in your White Lotus system, Sifu? Yeah, it's still there. Yeah, we teach the form and so forth. Uh, I learned it uh, when I first opened up my Chinese physical health club. Uh, it was made all Chinese members. That's why the name Chinese physical health club. And later on, uh, that was back in 66 when I started. I didn't start teaching until 1968, and that's when my garage came in. And during that time period, it was all Asian guys. So black, Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, <laughs> Korean, and so forth. So it was a Chinese physical health club, but I kept the name anyway. So that's how we did. Until I opened up my first studio in 1973, which was Cinema of Kung Fu. I got on the system. So that's how that all started. So Wing Chun was... My first student that I taught was Wing Wong, who passed away. But his cousin was Walter Wong. And that's where I learned my Wing Chun part. So I was working with him. Uh, I was trying to learn a different system about it, and it's Chi Sao. That's the main thing I wanted to learn what that was all about. And so, so when the Chi Sao standing still, you know, in the, in, in just doing the basic drills, you know, he was tap, you know, Popping me all over the place. But then afterwards, what happened was I started exchanging my system of the Mok Ta with the footwork. And that's what made him even a better fighter. Because a Wing Chun is limited in the footwork. You only got this sure. drag, side drag, front drag, you know, and so forth. But with our, our, our Mok Ta, we got like 24 different uh, shuffling movements that take you into the person, away from the person. And an angle and so forth, and adding our, our slapping hand, which is it was different what you probably see in Kempo, with the slapping, touching the shoulders, and so forth, taking on that noise. So, all that stuff was in the Mokha system. And Parker picked that up from Tiny Lafitte, my teacher. So, that's where all the slaps came in. Prior to that, there was no slap in the Kempo system. That didn't hmm. happen until after you learned from Tiny. So, that's why there's a difference. That's why. Our sister with Mr. Parker, we always we were good friends because our, our style was uh, like cousins to each other, the Lima Lama, the Kempo style, the Kaji and so forth. So, so that's why a lot of that was in there. So, and back in the so when I started moving on Walter with the footwork, this moving time didn't work during that time period. So that, that's why we exchanged it. So strictly just the uh, one time to uh, single hand, sticky hand, the double hand, sticky hand, sticky legs, so forth. You know, 
it was it was good for me to learn to understand it. And sure. In the first book, it was the first time they did the Hu Chun second book. Everybody else had already had the first form out already. So, uh, Jim Lee had one out, and the other guy from uh, England had one out, I forget who else had it. So there was quite a few as they had it. So the neat publication asked me, why don't you do the second form? Because nobody's done it yet. So that's why I did that. So some guys criticized I didn't have enough movements from the first form in there. I said, everybody else did it already. So I did it on the second form. So my book was the very first one on the second form. And so then people started looking at all oh, this great during that time. Now they talk about, oh man, the techniques are not that good. He's not that good. In it. Whatever. I was first with it, you know? It was mm. my first book. <laughs> you know, what was going on? And, and people still, I said, get letters all the time saying that that helped me learn the second form. You know, and people are still reading it. Like, but almost 50 years later, they're still there. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, I was going to ask you a little bit about your your healing practice, and uh, and I was curious: is this is it something you've done throughout your your whole martial career, and things you've picked up from different teachers, or did you have one teacher in particular who really influenced you, maybe more than other teachers? Uh, no, for a combination of different teachers. Uh, hmm. Also, didn't put down uh, my other teacher was uh, Doctor uh, Andrew Me, acupuncture. Because his family in Chinese history, uh, they're the first family to learn acupuncture or to develop acupuncture. We're talking about 99 generations. Because everybody else out here is only one or two, three generations. So through history, that his his family learned the acupuncture. So I studied with him. It took almost like three years of trying to learn from him. Because my mom was a patient of his. So you know, I had to ask him to mm. ask him. So finally, he said, okay. I teach you some of those six of us that went together as a class learning from him. And um, it, he showed us because he was good, not only the acupuncture, but also the Tai Chi. So he said, you got to have the Tai Chi to do the movement, to move the energy in your body. So, you can learn a lot of different things. so but he teaches in the acupuncture colleges, is 365 posts. And his family system is over 900 posts. Wow. So, wow. So, so, you know, you know, it's a whole different game all the time. When he used to do his acupuncture uh, treatments and stuff, he would just close his eyes. He didn't even look at the body. He just turned his head away and had his knees away, and he was going up and down the different parts of the body. So he would wow. see those fights. Hmm. But he just stuck his knees in there. Then you got to look at the depth. You got to look at the direction you have to turn. Uh, the needles. Sometimes you have to energy in there, other times you have to remove energy out of there. Mm -hmm. so you, yeah, that, that, that's what a lot of people understand. A lot of people, uh, the beginners, they use what's called the uh, sleeve, acupuncture sleeve. They put the up there and they put the needle on top and they push it and it stops it from going so mm -hmm. far. Down. Well, he, he said, yeah, that's a beginner. We don't do that. And his main thing was he never liked the like, electronic, you know, just where the modern, the modern acupuncture guys, they, they put on a machine now, causes that electric pulse to go into the body. Mm -hmm. That will throw your energy off. Don't do that. So that's why I learned from him. Because I have treatments done with the pulse on there. I mean, my body will easily afterwards, you know. That's after I could, uh, my teacher passed away. So I get some acupuncture treatments, and, you know, they were using all these different machines. But uh, it just threw my energy off. So I don't, I don't believe I have to go back to it. Over. So we we were getting treatment for his daughter. She kept it going for about twenty something years, and she retired. And so, um, and she was supposed to open up a clinic with her son, but he went to medical school, and became a medical doctor. They also mm. learned that. So they never did open up when we had it. So uh, I just don't go to any acupuncture people now. I just stay out of it. You know, I have the best treatments in the world from the man himself. You know so. Anything after that, I, I just can't believe in it or, or trust it. So his healing, he showed me the acupuncture. I never got my license, so that's why I don't practice the acupuncture. He was the acupuncture board, California acupuncture board. He was a cousin. So we're, we're, after we went back, he got 
It's an accident. Some 18 year old kid has their Cadillac coming into his car and causing a lot of injury. Mm. It was doing okay for six months, and then six months after that, uh, the injury came back and uh, he passed away from that. So oh, wow. We got our license to practice and so forth. So after that, I, I didn't go anywhere else to learn from anyone else. So I just saw uh, a I remember his acupuncture methods uh, and his acupressure. So, like, when I do the teaching, like, when, the, when one of the students asks me a question, I always tell my instructor to where I talk to you must have 10 answers. You can't just have one answer. There's no one answer that completes everything that you want there. So, if the person has a difficult of learning, you may have to approach them with technique number two, or number four, or number six, or number 10. That's going to work. That's what you're going to do. So, all my students, when I tell my instructor, you got to have 10 answers for every question they ask you. That's why I do it. It's the same with my method of teaching. This one doesn't work for me. Sometimes the points are not always the same. They're supposed to be basically the same in the body. Sometimes it's off by a centimeter here or a centimeter there. So that's what you can look at. And then the connection may be very different. So the person may be born with defects already. It's not as what the regular human body is born with. So that's what you have to look at. Sometimes defect is the heart, not on the left side, it's on the right side. Sometimes the flow of the arm, you know, when you have a, uh, a past uh, injury, so that causes a uh, blockage. So sometimes you can't open it up, so you have to go around it. So that's the difference in the so, Yes, there's many methods of healing for you guys. Wow. That's awesome. you, you kept the that teaching methodology, though, also, Sifu, with your martial practice as well. You were saying that you also expect your martial arts instructors to also have at least 10 answers for one problem. And I, I really like that because that, that makes them not only just train and practice, but as teachers actually be able to study the art to understand what's going on on a deeper level, not yeah. just for themselves, right. but for the next generation. Yes. I think, I think that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Yeah, you do that. And some people, when they come to the school, they have injuries, you know, or injuries. Their knees don't work anymore. Or they have replacements. Or they have joint replacements. Uh, some people can't bend down a certain way. Some people can't stretch a certain way. Some people, the breathing method is done different. So you have to look at the person individually and work within what their body is capable of doing. That's what we're looking at. A lot of times, some guys can't drop it in these. I can't get the leading horse anymore. We I mean, also have to fake it now, Dave. But you know, but you still have to teach it so the students can understand it. So uh, that's why you have to go through it. So you, you have to learn all the basic stuff and certain limitations that you can't do. That's okay. But you still got to be able to teach to another person who can do it. So you can't be left out. Because that's where a lot of the systems got, got wasted out or, 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 uh, uh, not as pure because they were limited in what they could do, and that's what the way they taught it. And they went back and say, "Well, I teach you taught me this way, so you got to do it this way." But this is what I teach, so you do it this way. Got to have the two methods together. You can't lose it. That's how a lot of the system they use the technique. Well, he couldn't do this certain jump, and then stuff out of the system. I couldn't do this weapon because I was not good with it. I was not good with the left hand, but I could do it with the right hand. That's what you got to look at. So I didn't forget anything. It's still there. Everything is still there. I didn't, I didn't cut out anything. 
I just don't use it as much, but it's still in the brain. If I need to pull it out, I'll pull it out just for you. You can use it. That's the only thing I'm looking at. Everything in teaching, like I said, when you learn, when you're born, you got to learn cheap. Everything from the day you're born to the day you die. With all these methods in between. That's what I want for you. Wow. Well said. Well said. Um, I think I only have one more question. Owen, did you have any others? Uh, I've got a few, but go ahead. Oh, okay. So Sifu, and you don't have to get too deep or too personal with it, but you and I had a good conversation about a month ago before we had our previous conversation. I can't speak English. Excuse me. That we're having today. How are you healing? And and how is how are you doing? How are you doing these days? Because I know you've gone through some things. Are you how are you doing? How is how's your own practice going? How are how, are you getting back to where you're starting to feel better and maybe train I'm a little? Trying bit? to, I'm trying to. It's just, this diabetes is, is something else. You know? it, it's uh, uh, I've had my ups and down. I, I mean, I, I was uh, last month. I, I got to go out. I went to Dragon Fest. I went to the Hall of Fame event. Got to walk around the first time in four years that I've gone out. A couple weeks after that, I ended up back in urgent care again at the hospital. Uh, I got a flu infection and it started kicking me around. So, you know, my doctor limited me and walking. And, and right now, it, it's, it's, it's okay. It's not getting better, per se, as, as much as I want. So, yeah, it's hard to heal your own body a certain way. You know, you know uh, uh because you try to heal yourself but there's only certain things you can do. So, um yeah it, it's still a long way for me to go. Right now it's, it's, um doing my everyday, doing my you know, trying to work with leg, I'll get to see my doctor next week and you know, I got pain in my legs right now, I don't know why. And you know, he said, Oh it's just your legs swollen up, you'll be okay. Well it's been a month, it hasn't gone away yet, so I'm gonna see next week and you know, really See what's happening because I hope there's not an infection in the bone. You know, mm-hmm. there's certain things that I need some medicine will work, and certain times that it doesn't work. That's what I'm saying. You know, as I look, because my teacher, like she won't she, he had uh, liver cancer. After he found out, he passed away within a month. There are all the Chinese liver medicine, you know, so forth. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at. Certain times, Western medicine is kind of work, and these medicine may help. Yeah, so that's what we're going to do. So, but now I'm, I'm relying more on the. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um. Uh. This is so. My last question, and you know, out of out of all the the teachers you've trained with, who had the most impact on you? Who Who was your favorite? Any Lupini, Father Dow. Really. Yeah. Uh, with, with the fighting, my sister, uh, my white nose fighting system is based on that, like the Maka, uh, the footwork, the handwork, you know, so that's what I'm looking at. Because, uh, you know, it's good to do forms and weapons and so forth. You have to defend yourself with it. How to use That's what I'm looking at. You know, so what Tiny taught me uh, is everything. So street fighting wise, everything else, uh, defense wise. I mean, uh, one of the crazy things he used to do, uh, you know, like I said, with the baseball bat <laughs> and everything else. And uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff I can't talk about. Sure. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's, uh, there's some crazy stuff, but I know what he showed me. I can't teach it to anybody. I just talked about it sometime. Uh, there's a lot of stuff as I was involved in uh, any back in the old days, gang fighting. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was a whole different thing. Some things you just don't want to teach or, or talk about. It. Mm-hmm. That's part of it. Awesome. I've, oh, I've got one last one. Did you? Yeah. Um, I you said you had trained with Su Hong Chi some. Yeah. So, um, did you actually get to meet Hongi Shang, his teacher? No, I didn't. Dang. All right. Okay. Yeah. That, that that that's that that was it for me. <laughs> Sifu. Is there anything that you wanted to leave the audience with? Because, you know, you are a wealth of information and a wealth of knowledge. You, you know, I feel like you ran into everybody, you know, um, from your relation, your personal relationship from 
with Muhammad Ali to being involved with the Kung Fu series that started so many people on their journey with Chinese martial arts. Is there, is there a message that you'd like to tell anybody, the audience, maybe somebody that's trained for years, maybe somebody that's just taken their first martial arts class today. Is there something you'd like to pass on to the audience? The main thing is, if you're going to get into the martial arts, find a good teacher. That's a number one. Go in there, watch the different classes. Don't just take one teacher, you know, see the method he teaches. Is he compatible with the student? Is he talking down to him? Or is he friendly with him? And he explained to them, is the class running fine? Is there any problem? That's what you're going to look at. And talk to the other students that are there. See, get behind the scene. Don't just go to one student and say, okay, this is it. I'm going to stay right here. Check out, you know, four or five students. When I'm back in my days, I went to every school that opened up in California. You name it. When I was going first school down here, it's not going to be San Diego. Find what they had. See what they were doing. What the method was. So that's what's very important. Find a real teacher that you can communicate with, learn. That's what I'm doing. Make sure that they have safety wise, because some guys are just too crazy, and that's what you got to be careful on. Because, you know, there's a tradition of martial arts, as you say, the way we talk about Kung Fu, there's a the mixed martial arts. And mixed martial arts are a whole different thing to get in. We talk about, yeah, I mean, you know, cage fighting, different things like that. Are you ready for that? We have to be very careful about that. And also, I, I tell a lot of people when they start their students, uh, start their kids in the, in the martial arts, I, I tell them, you can you find a country school if you can. But it's very difficult for kids to learn Kung Fu through the various people. Other one, this temple system is very good for kids. I like to be trained in that for to get an understanding of what's going on. I try to keep them away from the tanks to go and fight on those because they teach aggressive to fighting. You're free fighting all day in the first couple of months. And you're trying to train these kids to be in control of themselves. These are not right. and charging, doing all this kind of stuff, taking down, you know, like not. That's what you're going to look at. What are you trying to learn? What are you trying to teach your kids? You want to teach them control, different things like that. I would say go to different schools. Right there. Kids that take Tai Chi, no, too young. You wouldn't understand the concept. It's just a waste of time to do. But all that my, I like when you go into the temple system, the air park system, and it teaches you more of uh, reality. So, so I, I would do that. And in Kung Fu, if you can find a good school that teaches you, so that's the main thing you got to look. They have a separate kids class that they can learn from. They, they can go out to all the kids to understand the methods and techniques. And is a fun for it. A lot of kids would quit that after a couple of weeks. I say, oh no, this is too hard. This is this and that. You know, the whole thing is that they learn the word no. I don't want to go anymore. No, I don't want to do this. No. When I train my kids, I train my kids before they can say the word no. I my son six months old, oldest daughter three months old, my youngest daughter two months old. They didn't know the word no. But I made them do movements. I made them do the stances. I made them do the kick. All part of it is like a routine of them eating or brushing their teeth every day. Mm-hmm. It was part of it. That's why they became so focused on their career, in the entertainment business, whatever they wanted to do. My my other daughter's a good chef, so all this it was always straight A's in school because they were focused on what they wanted to do. That's what you want to do is find a school that will teach you how to focus on your mind and body and spirit. That's what they were looking at. Hopefully that's the point that's, where we're to start. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Sifu, I, I have no more questions, Owen. I don't know. If, yep. Thank you I'm so good. much for your time. This thank was you. so much information shared. Um I, I, I just I'm I'm a little bit giddy and thrilled. And again, have a blessed day. Um heal well. And if you're in Colorado sometime, hit us up. We'd love to meet you. Take you out to lunch, Sifu. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Cool. You guys take care of yourself. Awesome. Like, yeah. you know, any other questions? You know, there's, I can still talk a lot, about a lot more. Well, we will have you on the show again <laughs> yeah. sometime, Sifu. Yeah, we'll do it again. Because I didn't even go through the entertainment part about uh, 
uh, Hercules, Xena, all the different movies we worked on, and uh, mm -hmm. him too, uh, uh, Doctor Strange, all that good stuff. Well, <laughs> next time you you also have to tell us about uh, how long it took to dig your brother out of a snowbank because that's a good story too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was the good old days, you know, but yeah, that's why that's why I don't miss the snow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get you here in the summer, my friend. Have yep. a blessed day, Sifu. Yeah, thank you. Hey, take care.